and uh, boyfriend girlfriend relationships. Did you know actually that it's mentioned in the Quran? Did you know that the Quran actually spoke about boyfriend and girlfriend relationships? Uh, this is not something new. Though we tend to think of it culturally, you know, coming from uh, our cultural backgrounds as something which is 20th century, it is something which is Western and so and so. But if that were the case, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak about it 1,400 years ago? If you go to Surah and Nisa, Allah says there in verse 25, what does that mean? Marry them, right? Allah is telling males, marry them, marry the women, with the permission of their families, meaning don't run away and elope and get married with nobody's permission. Give them their dowries, the mahar, according to what is reasonable. Then Allah described the women. They should be chaste, women who are not involved in any uh, premarital or extramarital relationships, nor adulterous or promiscuous, nor taking boyfriends. Muttakhidati akhdan. That is taking boyfriends. And in Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 5, we find Allah there also after describing uh, that He has made all the good things, the tayyibat, you know, halal for us. And the food of, of the people of the book is halal for us, and our food is halal for them. Then he goes on to say, He described the women who may be married that they are muhsanat the chaste women from among the believing women or from among the people of the book, chaste women. Then he goes on to say, if you give them their dowries, you, and he describes the males, what should, how should you be? You being chaste, that you should be also uh, not involved in adultery, fornication, etc., nor promiscuous, nor taking girlfriends. So we see in the Quran itself, Allah speaks about boyfriends and girlfriends. Because this is something, a phenomena, which is not unique to our times. It is something which occurred throughout the centuries, throughout the ages. Now, what may be unique to our times is the format in which it takes place. The format of boyfriend and girlfriend relationships is called dating. Going out with girls, girls going out with boys, they call that dating. Literally dating means the time at which an event occurs. But in the context that we're talking about, it means a social engagement between two persons with a romantic character. A social engagement, a social relationship, where they come together between two persons, male and female, that's how it was normally understood, with a romantic character. I mean, there's some romance there. There's some kind of love, attraction, etc. there. Now this, Dating is a 20th century invention. It wasn't until the 1920s, after World War II, that this new format of courtship, actually courtship meaning, 
the, the method by which people seek wives or seek husbands. They call this courtship. Right? Prior to this time, this didn't exist in the West. Courtship was formal. You had to uh, have chaperones. If you were to meet a female, this is in North America, here, Canada, in England, etc. You meet a female, there had to be a chaperone there with you. You know, her father, her mother, somebody had to be there with you, what we refer to as a guardian, hmm? although theirs was wider. And there was some commitment. People were meeting with the intention for marriage. Whereas, by the 1920s, this is after World War I, after World War I, women had come out of their homes, gone and worked in the factories, they're out and gaining uh, some independence, etc. You now had this new format of dating developing, which was informal, it was unchaperoned, male-female interaction with no specific commitment. No commitment here. And it came to be looked at as uh, a healthy preparation for, for future marital st stability. Multiple dating experiences, I said, they felt, because this was the time when people were looking at human beings now as animals because of Darwinian thought, etc. You know, so what was important was that, you know, uh, marriage which involves sex as its basis. This is, this is uh, an animal function. And of course, any of the physical functions, the more you practice it, the better you get. So the idea then was that multiple dating experiences would then lead to a person more prepared for a stable future in a marital relationship. And um, actually by the 50s, uh, this is again now after World War II, where more females went out into society, working, not going back into the home after the war, staying out, developing independence, you know, making decisions for themselves, etc. Now you find there is what they refer to as discontent with the restricted role of the wife. Women, to be just a wife and a mother, it was looked at as being some kind of oppression. You know, so many women started to postpone marriage to explore their college careers. Uh, and to, to them, marriage and childbirth was looked at as oppression and exploitation of women. So this is a consequence of the feminist re-examination of marriage in the 50s, as well as their uh, perspective on gender, male, female, status. So this opened the door to dating on a wide scale. So uh, the basic concept or idea behind it was that dating was a good way to know a lot of people by then. Dating was a good way to know a lot of people. So it developed what they call the shopping mentality. You know, as they say, shop till you drop, right? Uh, that was the idea. You go out and shop, shop around. If you decide you've got a product, you don't like it, take it back. You can always take it back to the store. So the same kind of attitude, no commitment. So that is the foundation, really, of uh, girlfriend-boyfriend relationships, which we refer to as uh, dating, dating being the format in which those relationships develop. The question now comes to us as Muslims living in this part of the world. What do we do with this practice? Because obviously we saw in the very beginning Islam prohibits it. So how do we deal with it? Now to look at how we deal with it, I'm going to ask you some questions. To look at how we deal with it, I'm going to ask you We got it together now? Right. We want to have a look now at 
how do we deal with this? First question let me ask you here, among you. How many of you have girlfriends? Put your hand up. Be honest. The camera is just on me. Not a single one of you has a girlfriend. Come on, be honest. Okay, we had a few hands sweeping up and down quickly. How many of you would like to have a girlfriend? <laughs> okay, we saw a couple more hands. <laughs> All right, that's honest. Now, the point is, having a boyfriend or having a girlfriend, why? Why? Why do people have boyfriends and girlfriends? Tell me, what do you think? In school, your friends, the other people in your classes, class has, have boyfriends and girlfriends, right? Huh? They have or not? What grade are you in? Five. Grade five, okay. Maybe in your school they haven't started yet. Somebody in a, in a uh, higher grade. Yeah? What grade are you in? I'm in grade five. And in, in our school, there's kids in grade three. They, they have all these girlfriends. Okay, from grade three they have girlfriends. All right. He's in grade five. He's observed that already. Who is in a higher grade here? Huh? What grade are you in? Huh? You're in grade six. Oh. Okay, in grade six, do you have, uh, some of your classmates have girlfriends? Not really. We have different kinds of schools here, I guess. Huh? Some more conservative schools and some more uh, liberal schools. Huh? Okay, in your school, having a boyfriend? You gotta talk to the sisters too, because they can see you. Mm -hmm. But how can I get from them? Uh-huh, okay, yeah, we needed to hear from the sisters also, but um, uh, if they can uh, write some responses and send it back across to us quickly uh, as we ask the questions. Okay, you said that um, they, mostly they're doing it for social status. Mm -hmm. Now, to be popular, you know, it's to be popular is to have a girlfriend, right? In your school? In my school, if you don't have a girlfriend, you're gay. <laughs> if you don't have a girlfriend, you're gay. That's, uh, that's another s label, right? <laughs> it's a, in other words, it's, it's natural, you're, you know. If you're a real male, you know, a real male, you should have a girlfriend, <laughs> right? Okay, anybody else? Huh? Huh? Did you raising your hand or are you stretching? Yawning. Ah, uh, early morning. What about yourself? Are you in school? Yeah. Uh, what, what grade are you in? Grade 11. Oh, man. Everybody in your class must have a girlfriend, right? Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> okay, I won't ask yourself because you didn't stick your hand up. I don't know whether you're too shy or what. But why do you think people are having girlfriends? Huh? Huh? For desire, hormones. Okay, you're saying basically it's hormones. Drift. Hormones means they're desires, physical desires. Hormones are things which are secreted in your body which makes you, you know, have a desire for the female sex. This is for those people, of course, when you're reaching pu puberty. You know, when you reach puberty, then this change takes place in your body of hormones. And then this is when boys start looking at girls and these kind of things. Okay, hormones. What about yourself? What grade are you in? Grade 11, okay. What's the situation in your class? It's a trend. Everybody has a girlfriend. Huh? What about, what about yourself? I mean, how do you feel? You feel left out? Huh? You don't feel left out? Okay, I, I want to ask you, is it because you have one or? <laughs> All right. Um, the, the problem which exists 
with the boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, for, I think, for most parents, Muslim parents, in terms of how do you prevent it, parents, I think, generally just lay down the law that you just, it's not supposed to happen. Without really explaining to the youths, the children, the males and the females, why? You know, it's just our culture, we don't do it. Just make sure you don't have a girlfriend, make sure you don't have a boyfriend. Don't. Wrong. But in fact, really, when youths reach the middle teens, this is the period of what? Huh? Period of marriage. Well, in the old days it was. It was the period of marriage in the old days. But in our days, basically it is the period of rebellion. Teens, the period of rebellion. Right? What grade are you in? Grade 9. How do you feel? Feel like a rebel? You don't feel like a rebel? You don't feel a desire to rebel against what your parents say? Huh? No? Well, that's good. Alhamdulillah. But what about your other classmates? Are they all obeying what their parents say? The one who obeys what the parents say, that guy's looked at as a sissy. Look at him. Whatever his parents tell him, he just does it. You know? Whereas, you know, a real youth, I mean, in terms of how they perceive it, is one who does his own thing. And he doesn't have to listen to the parents. Of course, it's not good. But that is a norm for that age group, isn't it? Rebellion. So, it is the responsibility of parents to communicate with the children, with the youths, why? Why is this not permissible in Islam? Why, from the Islamic perspective, relationships are either marriage, right? Male-female relationship is in marriage, you should be married. If it's not marriage, then there is no other relationship. Yeah, it is going to be some form of adultery, fornication, zina is the term which the Quran uses. And it's important for parents really not to wait until the kids or the young people fall in love and then they find out and then they explode. This is what happens at home, right? World War II. Explosion. They finally found out. Huh? Huh? Halifax explosion? All right. So, it's important for parents basically to convey to young people, for you young people to understand that girlfriend-boyfriend relationships is basically, such relationships are basically fornication. Fornication is a sin. Something which is displeasing to Allah, first and foremost. Something in Islam for the punishment for fornication is what? What's the punishment for fornication? Stoning. No. That's for adultery. What's the punishment for fornication? You get put in an oven. We, anybody who we catch fornicating, we put them in an oven, right? <laughs> Is it? Put in an oven, huh? What's the punishment? Huh? 100 whips. That's it. 100 lashes. Public. That is according to Islamic law. If a person is caught in fornication, male or female, they're taken publicly in front of the community and lashed 100 times. No, people don't die from it. They, the lashing is not, it, it's painful, of course. Because even if I hit you 100 times just like this, not winding up each one, if I wind round up each one, maybe at 100 you might die. But if I'm just lashing you like this, 100 times, same area, it's going to become painful after a while. Maybe initially it's not painful, but after a time it's going to become painful. But the idea 
is not so much the pain, but the shame. The shame of being imagined, taken to the CNE, right? On the field, all the whole hundred thousand people watching, and they take you and lash you in front of all these people. It's the shame. Huh? So it's the shame that in Islam, when the punishment is given, it's done publicly. So it is something shameful. The person who is involved should feel shameful. But besides that, what is the consequence? What are the consequences of boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, dating, etc.? Give me one consequence. You can go to hellfire. Yeah, in the next life, Prophet Muhammad when he related to us that he had a dream where Allah showed him the hellfire and the people of the hellfire. Among them were some people who were naked and burning in an oven in the dream, in the hellfire, burning in the oven. And when he asked the angel who showed him, who are these people? He said, these people who are those who committed zina in this life. Okay? So we don't put them in any oven here in this life. If we catch somebody, we don't open up the oven, throw them in, and fry them up. No. Uh, that is in the next life. Punishment in the next life. And of course, in hell, this is a very, very severe punishment. But in, in terms of the consequences in this life, what are the negative, what are the bad things that come out or can come out of boyfriend-girlfriend relationships? One bad thing. Huh? Yeah, I mean, that, we're saying that. If where people commit zina, where they commit, you know, fornication, what is the consequence? What are the evil consequences in this life from it? Tell me one. If you can't think of any, then it sounds like you guys are all convinced it's a good thing. <laughs> That's what it means, isn't it? If you can't think of any bad consequences, you know, besides being put in the oven in the next life, 100 lashes in this life, if you can't think of any harm that will come to you or to people around you from it, then it means you must think it's a good thing. Is that what you think? You don't think it's, it's, a good, it's not a good thing? Okay, so what's the consequence? What will happen? You get slapped by your mom. Well, so, that's, that's back to lashes again, right? That's back to lashes. I'm talking about real consequences. That's going to hurt you and really hurt for a long time. You know, the slash, your mom slaps you and it goes away, finish, you know. No, yeah, I'm asking the kids actually. Okay. Let them say it. I want them to get there. Huh? You what? Never see the day of light. Never what? Never see the day of light. Never see the day of light. What does that mean? <laughs> Never see the light. In prison? No, no, you don't stay in prison. You're 100 lashes publicly and then after that what? Hmm. Pardon? Your mom and dad won't like you? Well, okay. They may not like you for a while, but then after a while they may like you again. Huh. What? Bad? A bad record. Ooh. Okay, we need, some, we need some older guys to put something in here now. Huh? STDs. What are STDs? Sexually transmitted diseases. AIDS, herpes, you know, gonorrhea, syphilis, you know, all these nasty diseases, okay? You know? And you know, listen a minute, listen a minute here. There is one herpes, you don't, people don't talk about herpes anymore. Everybody's talking about AIDS. But really, herpes, way back, I remember in the late 70s, that, you know, in the 1970s, before most of you guys were born, in the late 70s, it was announced by the Surgeon General in America that herpes had reached epidemic proportions. 
epidemic. It, had, it was already on the level of an epidemic in the late 70s. In the 90s, they said, one in every four Americans has herpes. One in every four. It's an STD. It, well, you get bumps and sores and feel nasty and, you know, hot flashes. And your life becomes very uncomfortable. It doesn't kill you, but it makes life very uncomfortable. You know, like something like gonorrhea and syphilis, these things. It's similar. But one in every four Americans, one in every five Brits, I don't know what it is, the statistics here in Canada, but I'm sure it's probably close to the American statistics because we are the 52nd state, aren't we? Like it or not. <laughs> Following what trends are in America, right? So sexually transmitted diseases. Okay, so these are nasty things that come upon us and come upon our families. Also, give me another consequence. Huh? It can lead to depression. Um, okay, boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, which are not permanent, it's not about marriage, usually end up breaking up, and when they break up, then people become depressed. And this is what leads, oftentimes, Columbine massacre, you know, the guy, young guy gets jilted by his girlfriend, girlfriend says, okay, we're off now, I'm not your girlfriend anymore. So he goes and he gets his father's gun collection, he comes back to school and starts shooting the teachers and students. Yeah? Shameful. Well, yes, it's shame on the family. Mm -hmm. Okay, it can, those kind of relationships can make uh, you know, this is especially in the case of the girls, you know, where when time for marriage comes, it's known that this girl's been going out with different guys. It's not known whether she committed zina or not. So it, it lessens her chances for proper and good marriage. Let me give you some other points. You guys are taking a while to get to it. We have illegitimate kids. Illegitimate kids. Kids who are born now not inside of marriage. You have young girls having kids and this number the number of children being born outside of marriage is reached a level in the west which is almost equal to the number of children being born inside of marriage single parent families this is what they call it you know broken up families so children are being born without some of them knowing who their father was you know and also, what it leads to is abortions. We have over 3 million abortions. North America and U.S. alone, 3 million abortions every year. Those are statistics from the 90s. 3 million children, babies, are killed every year. 3 million, imagine that. That's evil. So, it, the girlfriend-boyfriend relationship has bad consequences. It's not good for family. You can't make a family with it. It only creates harm in the society. So this is what we as parents need to convey to make the children, young people understand. Now, the response of some kids to this, are you guys following me? The response of some kids to this, when parents say to them, no, you shouldn't have a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, you know, it's only marriage, they say, well, you know, those consequences, that's for people who end up having sex and these kind of things. We're not going to do that. We won't go that far. We just, you know, it's just a simple date, you know. I just want to have a friend who's a girl, and she wants to have a friend who's a boy. Just friends. Well, uh, the answer to that, just having friends, we're just going to be friends, we're not going to go that far, 
The answer to that is what? When two people are alone, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Who's with them? When two people, when a man and woman who could, be get, could get married, okay, a young man and a young woman, a girl and a boy, when they are, not, not brother and sister, but when they are girlfriend and boyfriend, when they're alone, who's the third that's with them? Shaitan. Prophet ﷺ said the third with them is Satan. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah, Satan's the devil, but I mean, what does it mean that the, that the devil is with them? What does that mean? Huh? He confuses them to do bad stuff. He whispers to them. He whispers to them. Maybe they said, okay, no, we're not going to do these things, but Satan is there whispering in the air. Oh, why don't you touch her? Why don't you put your arms around her, right? Why don't you dance with her? Then next thing you know, you're aware you said you weren't going to be. Right? That's the point. That Satan is with her. With them means that he is going to whisper until they end up doing what they said they weren't going to do. So this is why in Islam we say no. Male and female should not be alone together. Because the consequence is going to be Zina. La. Hum badaw mutakhirin. Huh? <laughs> you know? I, if you give me uh, three quarters of an hour to do the talk or not? Okay. Before we get to the solution. First, I mean, we have to teach, as parents, we have to teach children you know, how to restrain themselves. Give them examples that the Prophet ﷺ gave. Like the seven people who are shaded by Allah's throne. Seven people who will be shaded by Allah's throne on the day when there will be no shade. What is that day? The day of judgment, right. The day on which there will be no shade. The sun will be brought close. People will be without clothing. They'll be sweating. Some people sweating up to their necks, to their to their waist, different people sweating according to how scared they are for the evil they've done in this life. That day is a very, very terrible day. And the only shade will be the shade of the throne of Allah. And under that sh throne, there will be seven groups of people shaded by the throne. One of them... Now I can turn off the microphone there. One of them is who? You heard about this? You never heard about this before? Huh? Uh -uh. No, it has to do with boyfriend girlfriend relationships. Prophet spoke about it. One of the seven who would be shaded is who? You, you. Yeah. You don't know. You never heard this hadith before. Very, very important hadith. Huh? One of them who will be shaded is who? Yeah, a young man who grows up worshipping Allah. That's good. Alhamdulillah. One who stays on the right path, does what Allah says, grows up a proper Muslim. That will be one of the people shaded. But there's another young man who was caught up in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. Huh? Yes, the young man who is about to commit zina. He's about to have relations, sexual relations with his girlfriend. Who is beautiful. And from a good family, she has money, position. And then he stops himself and said, I fear Allah. That person, even though what he was doing, the fact that he got there, he was in sin. It's haram. But the fact that he stopped himself, Allah rewards him so much that he puts him under the shade of the throne on the day when there's no shade. Except that shade. That's pretty good, isn't it? Wouldn't you say so? Also, for parents, 
It is important to train children from an early age not to mix freely with the opposite sex. To train them from an early age not to mix freely with the opposite sex. Because if they're doing it from an early age, and then when they reach puberty, you say, no, it becomes difficult. They've become used to playing, you know, um, entertaining themselves, male-female relationships are already developing. So we have to introduce an awareness from an early age. Also, it means encouraging them not to look at the opposite sex. Not to, st of course, you have to walk in the streets. It doesn't mean you'll never see anybody from the opposite sex, but not to stare. You know what stare means, right? Yeah. Not to stare. Because looking, well, you're going to see. But when you see, you can either continue to see and stare, or you can look away. So, we have to teach them that, both males and females. And for females, especially, we have to teach them that when they communicate, when they talk with males, they have to talk in a business-like way. Talking in a business-like way. What does that mean? It means that, can males and females give salams to each other? Okay, those who say that males cannot give salams to females, put your hands up. Those who say they can, put your hand up. Yes, they can. Males can give salams to females, but, and females can give salams back to males. Islam does not uh, say no. It didn't prohibit it. Prophet ﷺ gave salams to females, sahabiyat, they gave salams to males. It was not something which was prohibited. Islam does not prohibit the giving of salams. In fact, it encourages you know, the giving of salams all around. However, how you give salams is now the issue. Avoid competition. Because, no, not just the salam itself. You can say, as a male, salam alaikum, or you can say, salam alaikum. <laughs> right? And as a female, you can answer, wa alaikum salam, or you can answer, wa alaikum salam. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's two different things, yes. right? So the young girls and the boys should be taught that when they communicate with females, that they should do so in a business-like fashion. When you're going to the shop, you're buying something from the storekeeper. I mean, you're not trying to flirt with the storekeeper, right? You say, I, I want this, give me that, so much. How much is that? So, you're talking business. And that's how males and females who can be married should talk. Business. Right? So we have to train the youths from males and females to talk business. Girls have to be taught how to wear proper hijab from an early age. And boys also proper Islamic clothing which don't expose different parts of the aura and which can conform to Islamic principles. Right? For both males and females. Let's not think that dress is only for females. Females need to cover themselves up and the men, you can wear anything. No. There are principles that govern men's clothing, just as there are principles which govern females' clothing. And it's very important for parents to keep an open relationship with their children so they can hear from them. They can know what's going on so that they can address these issues if they start to arise. Now, the second part, uh, concerns how do we deal as parents with such a relationship when you find out that your children are involved. Do you explode? You lock the girl in the room, take her out of school, 
and go, some people go to the extent of what? Honor killing. You know what honor killing is? If a girl is found to go out with a, a boy in some parts of the Muslim world, in Pakistan, in Jordan, in Turkey, different parts of the Muslim world, if they find that the girls have gone out with guys, then the father, the brother, the, the uncle, or some male will take her and kill her. Kill her. They, they call it honor killing. Unfortunately, it's not from Islam. It's culture. People do it. Many women are killed every year on this same principle. They call honor killing. In Germany, just last week, a couple of girls were killed there by their brothers, fathers, because they dishonored the family. So what is our reaction when we find out that our children are involved in some relationship like this? We don't explode. So if we don't explode, then what do we have to do? We have to deal with the situation realistically. Explosion only produces rebellion. If we explode, we scream, whatever, then the kid's going to try to figure out how to run away. Pack their bags when you're sleeping at night and, you know, get out the door and they're gone in the wind. So rather than create a situation of rebellion, it is important to build bridges between yourself and the young people. Meaning that the reason why they're in that situation is because there is no bridge. There was a gap, communication gap. You had no idea what was going on. So parents have to look at this when they find this kind of situation. They have to look at themselves as being at fault here. It's not all on the, ch on the young people. Some of it falls back on the parents. So they have to address what has taken place. What has broken down in the Muslim family which has created this situation. We can't blame it all on the media and in the environment and everything. We have to also look within our own situation. Why? Why did it take place? We have to find out why it took place in order to try to deal with the issues. The main, per the main causes, what are the main causes? Some of you mentioned before, peer pressure, popularity, seeking popularity. For some people it's boredom. Some people it's low self-esteem. Some people need to feel loved. Some people it's an expression where they're desiring attention. So parents need to communicate. And in communicating with somebody who is involved, you don't want to be accusative. You did this! Nor do you want to be jud judgmental. You are a so-and-so. Or to be interrogative. Why did you do this? You should try to avoid as much as possible the shoulds and the don'ts. These are negative terms. And important to listen. Listen with an ear to understanding why. What caused this? What is at the bottom of it? Try to get clarification. Ask them, do you mean so and so and so? Acknowledge the things that they're saying. You feel this way because of so and so? Empathize. Try to let them feel that you can understand what is going on with them. You sound really so and so. So, kids will feel and un that their parents understand. If the children, young people, feel that the parents understand where they're coming from, then they will confide in them. Because young people will not confide if they don't feel that sense of understanding, that they can talk to the parents. So, as a basic principle, parents should keep in mind, if you want to be heard, then you need to be good listeners. If you want to be heard, because you want to be able to inform and to advise, then you have to be able to listen well and to hear where those young kids are coming from. So what is the solution? That's what you asked for. We're going to finish off now with the solutions. What is the solution for all of this? One, 
We have to understand that for boyfriend-girlfriend relations, the most fundamental factor, the most fundamental factor which leads to it is insecurity. Insecurity. Why insecurity? Insecurity because peer pressure, when a person suffers from peer pressure, where they're forced into, pushed into, you know, getting a girlfriend because everybody else has a girlfriend, it means that that young person is not secure. They don't feel uh, secure about themselves. They don't feel self-esteem. They don't feel, I'm a Muslim, this is, you know, it's not for me, it is harmful, so they can be themselves. So they feel insecure, that's why they go along with the group, isn't it? Also, popularity, when people want to be popular, everybody else is, you know, you want to be popular amongst everybody, this is, this is a result of you not feeling secure again with yourself. If being popular means doing haram, what, what is the use of that popularity? Means you really don't have confidence, self-confidence. If being popular is going to cause you to go and do haram. Also boredom. Boredom. You don't feel comfortable in your circumstances. This is again an element of insecurity which leads to Also low self-esteem. Feel loved. The need for attention. Children get involved in these things, get attention from their So it means this attention or seeks attention. This is the result of what? Again, being feeling insecure. Do my parents really love me? Do they really care about me? So I have to do something to catch their attention. So it means then for parents, we have to, the main solution is to give the young people the proper love and attention they need. We need to teach them to feel good about themselves and about Islam, about the religion. So they don't feel shy, they don't feel embarrassed, they don't feel a need to want to be like everybody else. And to build self-esteem in dealing with our young people, we have to acknowledge the good things that they do. And sometimes we are overcritical. We criticize everything and we can't speak about any good. But this is very important for them to hear support, you know, praise for the good things they did, their achievements. And also, we have to assign them challenging tasks in life that they can get involved, be, be, be productive that they feel like they're involved in something, they can feel some kind of uh, success in doing things successfully and properly, they're, they're, to keep them away from boredom. And also encourage them to make new friends, instead of that peer group that was messing them up, to find new friends. What do you think about that? Huh? What do you think about that? Ah, you're having your own private little discussion here. Huh? Huh? What did you guys think? Hmm? What are, what are you guys talking about? Huh? Huh? You're not talking about anything? Ah, uh, that's crazy people who don't talk about anything. They just keep talking and they're not talking about anything. That's crazy people. You guys crazy? No. Alright, so what are you talking about? Nothing relevant to this. Nothing relevant to this. Well, well. Isn't this an important topic for you? Yes. Huh? Well, then we should try to keep, you know, keep relevant. You know, you have something to share, then share with us. Okay. All right? You don't come. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Wait. So, um, as we said, among those final solutions, we try to encourage them to make new friends. And for those young people, for those young people who the, the major force driving them into this situation is the hormones 
For those who have that problem, if it's a hormonal problem, then what's the solution? Parents, what's the solution? We have young kids that have hormonal drives, that making them go towards uh, male-female relationships. What is the solution for that? Huh? Marriage. That is it. Early marriage. That is the solution. Your parents will help you. Are you going to find a girl? Your parents will help you. My son, my son Yusuf, he got married when he was 16. His wife was 18. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Because he said, I told my, I told my kids, anytime you guys feel that you need to get married, then let me know. You know, we'll try and find you a husband or try and find you a wife. Because... Kids shouldn't feel that, you know, there's no other option but boyfriend and girlfriend. No. And of course, that kind of marriage is, you can, you can have marriage where you have what they call the nikah, the actual marriage contract is done, but consummation, walima is done later on. You know, the girl can still remain with the father, the, the, the young man can still remain with the, his parents, and... When they reach the point, they graduate, they're in a position to look after a family, then they come and live together. This is, a, this is an important solution which we need to realistically look at, for this, especially for this type of environment. You know? So we need to try to keep the, the uh, lines of communication open in general, and then we have to take practical solutions for problems which will not be solved and by any other means other than early marriage. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us, saying, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab man istata'a minkum ul-ba'a falyatazawaj. Oh young people, any of you that is able should get married. What's your question? Here's an example of what? Why? Why are you snitching on him? He wants to talk about it? No, you don't need to point fingers. If people want to share it, let them share it. If they don't want to share it, you know. But uh, inshallah, if you want to discuss it privately later, we can sit and talk, inshallah. Uh -huh. Oh, it's a false accusation. All right. <laughs> okay. Anyway, barakallah fikum. I hope that uh, some of the things we talked about made sense. And um, a lot more parents needed to be here to understand this issue better because really a lot of it lies in their hands. Barakallah fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.